Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about illegal weapons shipments from the United States to Israel. We are joined by two guests. Josh Paul resigned from the U.S. State Department in October 23 due to his disagreement with the Biden administration's decision to rush weapons to Israel. He had previously spent over 11 years working as a director in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. He is a non-resident fellow at the organization Democracy Now! for the Arab World, or DAWN, and a recipient of the 2023 Callaway Award for Civic Courage. Mike Ferner, a previous guest on this program, is current director and a previous president of Veterans for Peace. He is a former city council member of Toledo, Ohio, and he is the author of Inside the Red Zone, a Veteran for Peace Reports from Iraq. Uh, Josh and Mike, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, there, there's not much talk about the legality of weapons being sent to Israel. There's not enough talk about the immorality, but there's almost none of the illegality. Um, and Veterans for Peace has published this letter uh, referring to six different laws that may be being violated, I think pretty clearly are being violated. Uh, for people who don't have a clue, can one of you fill us in on what some of these laws are? Let me, I'd, I'd uh, like to, before Josh fills us in on some of the particulars, I'd like to just mention that that letter came about because of a very interested citizen who is an attorney, uh, but he has been uh, on a volunteer basis doing a significant uh, human rights, First Amendment, and all sorts of uh, public interest law. His name's Terry Lodge. He's from Toledo, Ohio. And uh, he spent untold hours uh, putting all that documentation together so that we could provide a concise uh, chapter and verse of exactly what is going on, just in case anybody in the State Department or the Biden administration has not been watching the news lately. But, but Josh, I'm sure you have a little finer point you can put on that. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and thank you both. Uh, great to join this conversation. It's a really important conversation. Because, as you said, David, that it's that's not just about uh, you know moral questions here, about policy questions here, but there's some real legal issues as well. Uh, there are several facets of U.S. code uh, that I believe we are violating right now in the provision of our arms to Israel, and in some cases quite transparently so. Um, and yet, this administration has gone out of its way uh, to not apply the law to itself uh, in the context of Israel. This isn't new. I've seen this uh, throughout my years in the State Department, working in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs, where there is a double standard. Uh, there are you know, laws that we apply to all of our other allies and partners. Uh, and then when we turn to Israel, we apply them differently. And I think what I and others are, have been arguing for a long time is not that Israel should be held to a higher standard uh, or to a lower standard, but basically that it should be held to the same standard uh, as we hold every other country. So if, if I could just for people's benefit, uh, ask you about some of these particular laws, the first one is called the conventional arms transfer policy. Is, is this being violated? Well, yes, it is. And, and let me just clarify, the conventional arms transfer policy is, as its name suggests, a policy uh, rather than a law. And so the challenge you have there is that it is, uh, well, theoretically binding. Uh, in practice, there is no legal enforcement mechanism for it. Uh, the conventional arms transfer or CAT policy, uh, every administration, I, I think since Reagan, has issued some variation of the CAT policy. Uh, what makes the Biden administration's variation of it, which was published and, and promulgated uh, by the White House, by President Biden, about a year ago, in February of 2023, uh, is that for the first time, it actually includes directive language. Uh, what I mean by that is historically, the CAT policy has sort of laid out a framework of, you know, here are some things to keep in the back of your mind as you are, you know, approving the export of US arms. Uh, what the Biden administration cap policy does for the first time is expressly say uh, that, and I quote, the transfer of arms shall not be authorized if it is more likely than not, unquote, and then, if, you know, that those arms will be used to violate and it lists a series of, uh, you know, of human rights violations. Uh, so I think it is clear in the context of Gaza 
that the arms we are providing to Israel, particularly things like uh, air-to-ground munitions, tank ammunition, artillery shells, uh, will more likely than not uh, be used to commit human rights violations in Gaza. Uh, so that is, I think, a, a very clarion example uh, of how the Biden administration, having set a policy in place, uh, is simply setting it aside in this context. I, I've always wondered about these policies and laws, it, 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 the question being, how do you use instruments of mass murder and not violate human rights? Uh, <laughs> is it by killing people who are in militaries? Because almost every war kills mostly civilians. What what would be a transfer of weapons to someone that where they weren't likely to be used in violation of human rights? Or does that have to mean not likely to be used at all? And then what was the point of making them? Well, right. I mean, so so again, the, the standard in the in the cap policy is more likely than not. And, you know, just to be clear, having having worked in the State Department on arms transfers, on security assistance uh, for over the past decade, I do believe that there are a, a fair number of, uh, you know, situations and scenarios in which the provision of arms uh, it has a valid purpose. You know, one of those, of course, is deterrence. Uh, one of those is self-defense. And I think we see that playing out very vividly right now uh, in the context of Ukraine, which is facing a Russian onslaught uh, that is in violation of, of the laws of war, of international humanitarian law. Uh, and, you know, Ukraine does have a right to defend itself. And I've been proud uh, to have supported its right to do that. You are correct uh, that in all wars, civilians do die. Uh, I think there is a fundamental difference uh, between a partner or a party uh, that does its best to adhere to the laws of war, the international humanitarian law, uh, laws of armed conflict, uh, and cannot avoid in some circumstances uh, the death of civilians, uh, versus a partner uh, that takes no account of international humanitarian law uh, and seems, you know, willing uh, and, and intentionally uh, to be killing, you know, many thousands of civilians, many thousands of women and children uh, as part of a strategy uh, to essentially, you know, destroy the Gaza Strip. So I, I think there are differences here. Uh, and international human rights law, international humanitarian law does lay out uh, what those differences are. I, I, One of the things that uh, impresses me about that uh, policy that uh, you're, re Josh, David, you're referring to right now is... Uh, I can imagine, I, I can't uh, swear to this on a stack of Bibles, but I can imagine the Biden administration has been proud and has announced its uh, satisfaction any number of times with the fact that they have included this additional uh, restriction or declarative uh, uh, clause, as Josh was mentioning, uh, that makes it sound that much better than previous ones. And then what do they do? You know, they just go about business as usual. So. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. I mean, and if I can add, I mean, so the Biden administration was particularly proud uh, at the time yeah. that we issued that they issued this policy. And this policy is actually intended to reflect, although not incorporate, uh, existing international law in the form of the Arms Trade Treaty. Uh, that is a treaty that the United States has not signed on to, uh, sorry, or rather has signed on to, but has not ratified, uh, which, you know, specifies that arms should not be transferred where there is, quote, actual knowledge, quote, unquote. Uh, of of the potential for the misuse of those arms in the context of, of human rights violations, uh, more likely than not, as a standard, was intended to reflect the actual knowledge standard in the arms trade treaty without actually copying that language. Um, so I think you know, yes, we were proud at the time that we had you know sort of conveyed that that standardization of American policy to international law. Uh, of course, it is not touting uh, the conventional arms transfer policy these days. So that was the first of these six uh, laws I wanted to mention very briefly, and you suggested that it was not enforceable, which was a very encouraging thing because it suggests that maybe the other five might be. Uh, and the, the first of them is called the Foreign Assistance Act. Yeah, so the Foreign Assistance Act uh, of 1966 is one of the foundational uh, sets of laws uh, that govern secu US security assistance uh, in particular. And contains a number of provisions uh, that should, in theory, prohibit the transfer of arms to Israel in the current context. Uh, it certainly prohibits, for example, uh, the provision of assistance to a, government, uh, to a government that is engaged in, quote, a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. Uh, I think, you know, many of us, including myself, would agree uh, that one can look back many years across the occupation, uh, which is, of course, 
uh, in terms of you know the expansion of settlements, uh, the existence of settlements, the siege of Gaza, predating uh, this path's fall uh, in violation of the Geneva Conventions and of humanitarian law, um, and say that Israel has been engaged in such a, a pattern of gross violations of international human, recognized human rights. The problem with that particular requirement under the Foreign Assistance Act is it requires the president to make a determination. Uh, and, and this is the problem we see a lot in the US law, uh, is that there is nothing forcing a determination. However, there is another example in the Foreign Assistance Act, uh, which is now clarified or codified in US Code 22, US Code 23, 78-1, uh, which expressly prohibits the United States from providing security assistance or any assistance uh, to a country when it is known to the president that that country has obstructed uh, the delivery of US funded humanitarian assistance. In just the past week, we have seen National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan uh, very clearly say uh, that he is frustrated with Israel's obstruction of US funded flour uh, to go into that is supposed to go into Gaza. Uh, so that is, I think, a clear example where the president, where the White House knows that that obstruction is happening. Uh, and again, under the law, once that knowledge is existent, U.S. assistance cannot be provided to that government. Uh, and yet there has been no effort to enforce that law. Well, we get into Ronald Reagan territory here with what this president knows about anything. Uh, but uh, how who enforces it? Uh, you know, if if the president doesn't have to enforce it on himself, someone else has to enforce it. Right. Let me let me Josh before you respond to that one, and I'm not sure of those six how many of the of those this applies to, but Ralph Net Ralph Nader made a really uh, good point in a column that he wrote lately uh, talking about that letter to the State Department that includes those six laws, and uh, he may have been referring to just one or two of them. I'm not sure, but he said no citizen can sue the State Department to force them to enforce these laws about arms transfers. What has to happen is congressional committees have to have hearings, uh, come to conclusions and pass resolutions to make the State Department enforce them. Uh, so, you know, and, and Ralph said, that's not likely to happen as we know. So my rejoinder to that, when we sent Ralph's uh, column out to our members was to say, uh, Ralph's right. Uh, let's not hold our breath waiting for the, the Congress to do this. But in the meantime, that gives us uh, more than uh, good motivation to continue. And, and this is how I listed them, writing, calling, per participating in protests, and sitting down in the streets to block business as usual. And I know that's not really part of the legal uh, framework for these six laws, but uh, Clearly, none of those things are going to get enforced or taken seriously unless there's a political pressure to make it happen. Well, the no, other... Just... Sorry, go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, I, I think that's right. And, and that's a thread that does run throughout uh, all of these legal issues that we are talking about and are going to talk about uh, is the right to private action. Uh, you know, there was a case that was brought by um, the uh, uh, by CCR and by the Defense of Children in International Palestine uh, against the Biden administration in federal courts in the last couple of months, uh, which was argued on January 26th uh, in, in a California federal court, um, essentially saying that the Biden administration should be enjoined uh, uh, from providing lethal arms to Israel in the current context under uh, the Genocide Convention, to which the U.S. is a party uh, and to which the U.S. has uh, passed implementing law. Uh, this is one of the six laws that we're here to talk about. Um, you know, part of the government's response to that case was that there is no right of private action, uh, that if the U.S. government it wants to prosecute itself, uh, then the Department of Justice may do so. Uh, but there is no means for private citizens to pursue such action. Uh, I think, frankly, that remains an open question. The court didn't even get around uh, to considering mm. that aspect of the uh, of the defense's argument. Uh, it instead, you know, relied on the uh, political questions doctrine to uh, dismiss the case, although I understand that case is pending appeal. Um, but but that is certainly a valid question here of what do you do uh, when the U.S. executive branch is not enforcing law against itself and Congress as well, uh, particularly in the context of Israel, has no interest uh, as a collective body in taking the appropriate actions. 
you, you put a fire under their butts, I think. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's part of it, right? And then I think we also have to remember uh, that there are other bodies out there beyond the United States that do have a remit yeah. here, such as the International yeah. Criminal Court. Yeah. Uh, and I suspect that it is in those international bodies uh, rather than in U.S. domestic courts that we will finally see some action here. Yeah. Well, just uh, to get the names in, in addition to the conventional arms transfer policy and the Foreign Assistance Act, the laws we're talking about, one has been mentioned already, the Geneva Convention, well, the Geneva Convention Implementation Act in U.S. law, the Leahy Law, the U.S. War Crimes Act, and the Arms Export Control Act. Uh, do these all have similar strengths and weaknesses here in terms of enforcement? Josh, what you think? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are similar threads here, right? Just to very quickly touch on, on two of those, the Arms Export Control Act uh, and the Leahy Laws. The Arms Export Control Act, uh, for example, provides purposes for which U.S. transferred arms may be used. Those include legitimate self-defense, internal security, uh, and contributions, for example, to... Uh, you know, peacekeeping operations under the UN Charter or collective self-defense operations under the UN Charter. None of those, uh, you know, in legal terms, apply to what Israel is doing in Gaza right now. Um, and the US, the Arms Export Control Act is, is very clear uh, that US provided arms may only be used for the purposes for which they are furnished. Uh, again, we hit that problem of enforcement in the absence of executive willingness to, to enforce. The other one here, uh, and this is an interesting case study, is the Leahy Law. Uh, the Leahy Laws, named after Senator Pat Leahy, uh, recently retired of Vermont, uh, essentially say that the U.S. cannot provide military assistance uh, to any foreign unit that has been credibly alleged to have been involved in gross violations of human rights. Uh, there is a system that works around the world uh, when it comes to the U.S. working with units that have a track record of, of, of having been credibly alleged to be involved in gross violations of human rights, um, where you know there is a process before assistance is provided that units are reviewed, personnel are reviewed, there is a database against which they are reviewed, uh, and if flags arise, they are not provided with that assistance. Um, for the case of Israel, and, and just a couple of other countries around the world, there is a separate process. Uh, in the case of Israel, that is the Israel Lehi Vetting Forum, where essentially the approach is, look, we're providing so much military assistance to Israel, it would be impossible, uh, you know, poor State Department bureaucracy, to vet, you know, all of the Israeli security force units that are receiving this assistance before they receive it. So we'll just give it. And then mm -hmm. after having provided that assistance, I would argue in breach of law, uh, we will essentially be on the lookout for allegations of potential gross violations of human rights. <clears throat> uh, of course, in the context of Israel, the US has never come to the conclusion uh, and never sanctioned a unit or person under you know, the Israeli security forces for such violations, even though uh, it has reviewed what I can tell you are, are plenty of examples uh, of what are very credible uh, allegations of gross violations of human rights. But they can and do do it, uh, at least in the case of uh, in Sudan, uh, the special, was it the special response force? Uh, uh, that whole tragedy and collection of war crimes that's been going on, uh, Secretary Blinken did say they were in violation. So clearly, uh, when it comes to uh, countries and organizations that aren't on our favored list, those decisions can be made. And I, I wanted to throw this, this one thing in. I know uh, we're, we're running, running along here. Um, Josh mentioned, you know, if the executive won't enforce the law on itself and Congress isn't willing, uh, you know, then, then you have that whole train of what's next. And I just want to bring this up. One of the things that Veterans for Peace is, is working on and just at the beginning stages is to try to get our activity and our statements uh, to include a focus on who is actually governing in this country. Because uh, we know you can't get the executive to enforce the law on itself. And we know the same thing is true of 98% of, of Congress. Well, how did we get here and who elects those people and where does the money come from in the corporations that are benefiting from the arms sales and they fund the people who get elected who don't make sure the laws are enforced and on and on. So um, I think it's wonderful that uh, we're putting forward these six laws that are being violated and we need to uh, make uh, draw as much attention to them as possible. But uh, we can bang our head against the wall for another uh, couple generations and uh, not make those laws get enforced. 
uh, until we start figuring out how to uh, start running our own government, I guess, uh, in, in, in a short way to put it. I, I think very well put. I, I it's, Tell me if you think I'm wrong, but it seems to me on Capitol Hill, uh, the 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 radical progressive position uh, is, you know, demand a ceasefire while providing unlimited weapons, no questions asked. And the really extreme, like two or three Congress members position is to propose to redundantly create a new law to ban shipping weapons to Israel. I mean, they would always love to propose a new law rather than admit that there are yep. half dozen laws already being violated. Uh, yeah. So is is it a useful strategy to push those best Congress members to admit that laws already exist that are being violated rather than propose another damn law? Or is, is it more strategic to focus in general, as you suggest, Mike, in taking over the, the streets and nonviolent pressure on the, the, the Congress and the government and the society in general? Well, that's, you know, that's a question of, uh, unfortunately, we've already answered it, that we can, in fact, walk and chew gum at the same time. And so uh, there are, are those of us who uh, need to up our game about getting people in the streets. We can always do more of that and do it better. Uh, and there are people that thankfully, like uh, Josh Paul, who uh, have the inside information and lawyers like Terry Lodge, who have constructed this letter, who can take that on. And, and the government needs to be, I mean, this is supposed to be our government, right? And it's not doing what it's supposed to do. So we should be uh, hammering at it from every conceivable angle. So, jo Josh, Paul, when you resigned months ago now, there were reports, including from yourself, of some number of your colleagues being inclined to agree with you, likely to do something. Um, have any of them? done anything? Yes, uh, and I think it remains the case that there are a lot of people, and probably, if anything, a growing number of people within uh, government, within both uh, congressional staff, uh, but also within the executive branch itself, uh, who do not support the current US policy and are, are doing what they can to try and raise concerns about it and to change it. Uh, you know, I've heard from hundreds of people, not only within the State Department, but I've heard from people within uh, the Defense Department, the White House, the Department of Justice, the Department of Commerce, the US Treasury, the Department of Homeland Security, I could go on, uh, all of whom saying, you know, what we are doing is not only wrong, uh, and not only illegal, uh, but also is not in the US interest. This is undermining uh, our relationships across the Middle East and our global moral, moral credibility, um, and our ability to rally partners and allies around the causes that we believe in. Uh, you know, some of those individuals uh, have signed letters. Um, there have been some very public letters signed by over a thousand people, for example, uh, from the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, there was a letter a couple of weeks ago from 800 civil servants, both in the U.S. and Europe, uh, sort of you know speaking up, standing up, uh, and opposing the current policy. We've seen people standing in protests and in vigils outside the White House, uh, and using internal dissent mechanisms such as the State Department's dissent channel. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that any of this has really resulted in a change of policy, uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, as Mike has said, uh, this is this is a political challenge. Yeah. Uh, and the politics right now are trumping uh, the morality, the law, the policies. Um, but there are certainly a, a large number of people uh, who are deeply concerned. Josh, is there anything that we can do in, in Veterans for Peace and, and our, our colleagues in the movement? Is there anything that, that we can do to assist you or any of the, the uh, your colleagues that you mentioned to, um, you know, uh, get, I mean, if we could just get to know some of them, that would be nice uh, to encourage them to uh, speak out more publicly. I mean, I know it's uh, easy for me to say I don't have anything at risk and, and they would be risking something as, as you did and, and bless all of you for that concern. But uh, if, if there's anything that you can think of, whether you can mention it here or um, offline afterwards, where where we could um, be more supportive uh, of people who have those concerns so that they know that uh, their concern is appreciated and that we would do whatever we can. I mean, there are, uh, we, we have uh, legal um, assistance, uh, things within the government, the whistleblower protection and so forth, but also some really good organizations like the Center for Constitutional Rights, the National Lawyers Guild, 
uh, that uh, have people, dedicated people who have a long history of representing and supporting people who do step out. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of these people, frankly, are, are feeling quite alone, right? There is a climate of fear when it comes to raising criticism of Israel uh, within the US government right now, as there has been for a while, but particularly right now. Um, and, you know, in many cases, I have people reaching out to me and saying, you know, I don't know who I can talk to about this, where there are others in their very same office uh, who have also reached out to me. And I'm able mm. to say, you know, just go to talk to the person down the hall because they aren't able to say this publicly or they aren't able to express themselves freely, you know, even within the office environment. So I, I think to the extent that those of us outside of government uh, can provide reassurance, can provide, uh, you know, support publicly. Uh, to those who are speaking up, to those who are, you know, signing petitions, signing letters, uh, you know, endorse what they're doing, praise them for what they're doing. Uh, I, I think it's certainly helpful to those, uh, you know, who who do not, you know, know necessarily that there is this sort of, you know, a very, I think, broad public support yeah. Yeah. for the stance that they are taking. Uh, well, so I think that would certainly be, you know, the more we can express and, and support them, the better. We have just a couple of minutes left, um, and I, I I would love to go on for hours, but I and I hate to go off on a tangent, but I I cannot not ask the question of if if the contrast with the bad weapons to Israel is the good weapons to Ukraine, is there any concern with all the reports of the U.S. and allies? preventing peace negotiations from the early days after the Russian invasion to this day. Uh, if that is the policy, how is it justifiable? How is it a humanitarian good to be sending all of these weapons that are killing on a vastly greater scale thus far than in Gaza, uh, Ukrainians and Russians? Yeah, well, of course, let me just clarify that when you look at, for example, the number of children who have been killed, it is vastly more in Gaza uh, in four months than it has been in Ukraine over two years. Uh, you know, I think what this boils down to is the the notion, the ideal of self-determination, uh, that every people in every country deserve the right to decide for themselves through their democratic uh, organizing, uh, you know, what rights they have, what their borders are, what their rules are. Uh, that is a right that has been denied to the Palestinian people. Uh, the Palestinian people do not have self-determination. Uh, what they have is occupation. It is also a right that is being denied right now to the Ukrainian people, uh, particularly those who are under Russian occupation in Crimea and in the Donbass. Uh, so I think we can stand up for that right on a consistent and global basis uh, and, and understand that sometimes that requires, you know, providing security assistance uh, in order to enable self-determination. But if they don't have the right to negotiate a peace settlement, if they don't have the right to... to they have make the right. It, it, it is ultimately their call. It is ultimately the call of the people of Ukraine. And to this point, the public polling of Ukraine does not suggest any interest or trust uh, in uh, peace negotiations with the Russians. Well, it seems it before, wasn't. Go ahead, Mike. I, I'm sorry. Before we uh, go further on that one, Josh, if you would please... If nothing else, make sure that the people you, that you know who are uh, looking for some support get my email. But then re refer, re return to the previous programming here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I think this will have to be continued in, a, in another episode. I, I want to thank Josh Paul and Mike Ferner uh, very, very much for everything you're working on and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.